seated. <clears throat> Take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to our passage for tonight, Acts chapter 20. Uh, we're looking at uh, those very exciting verses that tell us what happens if you fall asleep in church. Acts chapter 7, verses 7 through 12. And, um, you know, uh, apparently somebody had read the bulletin this morning announcing that this was what I was going to preach on. I will not tell you who it was. But when I came over here a few minutes before the church services, that particular person, and I will not tell you whether it was male or female, was sitting in either his or her car and uh, apparently drinking some coffee. And that person rolled down the window and said, this is so I will not fall asleep in church tonight. <laughs> so please take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 20, verses 7 through 12. <clears throat> you remember the background for this, verses 1 through 6. We talked last week about the weariness of missions. So I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. And this, of course, follows that tremendous riot that took place back in chapter 19, where Demetrius and the silversmiths had raised a riot against the Apostle Paul. And so that's what's being referred to here in the first verse. After the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto him the disciples and embraced them and departed for to go into Macedonia. And when he had gone over those parts and had given them much exhortation, he came into Greece and there abode three months. And when the Jews laid wait for him as he was about to sail into Syria, he purposed to return through Macedonia and there accompanied him unto a into Asia, Sopater of Berea and of the Thessalon Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derby and Timotheus and of Asia, Tychicus and Trophimus. These going before tarried for us at Troas. And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came unto them to Troas in five days where we abode seven days. Luke certainly enjoyed giving a good rundown of the narrative of all the things that were going on with the Apostle Paul and especially he enjoyed uh, describing their journeys. And so as we noted looking through that passage that Many of the times when we are interested in doing something, we have false motivations for it. And that's what closed off our last session, that uh, our real motivation oftentimes is that we do not want to suffer. We don't want to lose any money and all the good stuff that's out there for the grabbing. And we talked about what Peter said about suffering because we have a real Christian testimony over in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as a busybody in other men's matters, or as an evildoer, yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. And Paul had just been through that. Uh, Paul had experienced what happened there in uh, <laughs> Ephesus, and uh, now the Apostle Paul is moving on. He's called the disciples together. He's ready to move to a new location. But we talked about how you keep from being ashamed of the gospel of Christ, and the Apostle Paul was clearly not ashamed of the gospel of Christ in this passage. Rule number one was keep your eyes focused on Jesus. They looked unto him and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. Psalm 34, 5. Rule number two was keep your heart obedient to the Bible. Psalm 119, 80. Let my heart be sound in thy statutes that I be not ashamed. You want to keep from being ashamed of the gospel. These are three principles that keep you from being ashamed of the gospel. Number one, keep your eyes focused on Jesus. Number two, keep your heart obedient to the Bible. Number three, always tell the truth. And Paul tells us that in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 14. For if I have boasted anything to him of you, I am not ashamed. But as we spake all things to you in truth, even so our boasting which I made before Titus is found a truth. And we talked about how the world will try to put us under false shame as a means of controlling us. There is true shame, of course, which comes from sin in our lives. And when the Holy Spirit convicts you of that sin, you need to confess it. That's Romans 6.21, What fruit had ye then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. There is a real shame. But there is a false shame when you're ashamed for sticking out like a sore thumb because you, as a Christian, really are different. 
because you as a Christian do things that show you're different. You know the truth. You do the truth. And we saw two passages that illustrated that. We talked about 2 Timothy 1.12, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. And for 2 Timothy 1.16, The Lord give mercy to the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. How important it is to make sure that the only time we have shame is when we have sinned, but never to be ashamed of Jesus Christ. Never to be ashamed of taking a stand for the truth. Never to be ashamed of doing what is right, even though the world may mock us and scorn us and try to give us a sense of false shame. And then we talked about how someday God is going to be ashamed of some of his children, that he will not be ashamed of the rest. Our Lord Jesus Christ said that he's going to be ashamed of some of us. Mark 8, 38, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Luke chapter 9, 26, For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. I think that none of us want to be in that position. But you know, if we're ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ, if we're ashamed of his words now during this time, this adulterous and sinful generation, if we are ashamed of him, Jesus specifically said that he will be ashamed of us. Are you open in your testimony? Do you love the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you love him enough to tell other people about him, even if they mock you? If you're ashamed of him, he will be ashamed of you. I think that's a rather serious indictment. But of others he is not ashamed. Hebrews 2.11, For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Imagine that, being called a brother of the Lord. Hebrews 11.16, But now they desire a better country. This is the heroes of faith. This is a chapter that deals with people who were not ashamed of Jesus, who were not ashamed of the testimony, who were not ashamed of stepping out, even though some of them it cost them their lives. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. So the real question to ask is, what would Jesus do or expect me to do in this situation? Because after all, someday we're going to give an account to him. To him. And he knows everything you have ever done. He knows everything you have ever said. He knows everything that you have ever thought. He knows every one of your motives. He knows every purpose in your life. He knows every one of your attitudes. Mm. And we're going to stand before him and give an account. Will he be ashamed of us? I hope not. Wisdom and courtesy are always required. Kindness in communicating even with obstreperous people is always required. Even when they mock and scorn us, we treat them with courtesy. We have not been called to be obnoxious for Jesus, but we have been called upon to always communicate the truth in every setting of life. Paul did that at Ephesus. Paul did that even though it affected the sales of the silversmiths. And there were those who hated him because of it, because it cost them money. We talked about identifying with people who are willing to be on the firing line. You'll probably get shot at yourself if you go up, up to the firing line to carry water to the, to the men on the firing line. <laughs> there are plenty of women during the Civil War and the Revolutionary War that were carrying men and uh, other goods to the front line and some of them got shot you know if you're if you're helping someone who's on the firing line you're gonna get shot at too and Gaius and Aristarchus that happened to them back in chapter 19 and then we looked at how there were friends that God provided other believers and some with positions of authority there in Acts chapter 19 and so with that we talked about the weariness of missions and the Apostle Paul 
gave us a list of the things that he had to go through as a, an evangelist and as a pastor. Things that he had to go through in his testimony for serving Jesus Christ. He gives a whole chapter of the Bible to that. Do you remember that? We probably didn't because I didn't read it to you last week. But I'm going to read it right now. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you as to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. In other words, Paul was worried about the church at Corinth because they hadn't really plugged in to what Paul had taught them. They might have another Jesus. They might have another gospel. They might have another spirit, all of a different kind than the Apostle Paul had preached to them. And Paul goes on and he says, For I suppose that I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles, but though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. In other words, you know my life. Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that you might be exalted because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely? I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. In other words, they didn't pay Paul either. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man, for that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied, and in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. In other words, the Apostle Paul had a few pressures on him before he even began his ministries. He had some pressures that came from the outside. He had some pressures concerning the people for whom he was trying to care, which is what we see in our text tonight. He had lots of gifts. He wasn't behind the very chiefest of the apostles, he says. He had a lot of knowledge. He'd studied hard. He'd learned well. He wasn't afraid. He wasn't a wimp. He was God's little bulldog. He hung in there when the going got tough. The tough got going. He was a man. A little guy, but a man. He goes on, verse 10. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man will stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth. But what I do, that will I do, that I may cut off occasion from them that desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. In other words, what he is saying is, there are people out there criticizing Paul. Now, I suppose every pastor, every missionary, every evangelist has had his or her critics. You know, just remember something. My dad told me this a long time ago. He said, son... Pay no attention to the critics. Nobody ever raised a monument to a critic. <laughs> they can criticize you all they want, but as long as you're doing the will of God, it makes no difference. What we're looking for are eternal heavenly rewards, things that God is going to give to us when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. Now listen to what Paul had to face. Here are his critics. Verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. In other words, they pretend to be good guys. But they're false. They're liars. They're deceitful, he says. They transform themselves into apostles of Christ. And then he says, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Folks, you know, there are people today who are claiming to get revelations from God. There are people today who say, an angel appeared and told them such and such. I've had people tell me about these experiences. I've had people tell me how excited they were because God gave them a special revelation. I scratch my chin and say, really? Did you know that revelation ceased with the close of the New Testament canon? That the book of Revelation says that anybody who adds to the words of this book, and that's the last book of the Bible, so if you add anything that you know, after that was finished, you're going to get the plagues of that book added to you. And if you take away from the words of this book, anything that you take away, 
That is, if you give a revelation that's contrary to what God has already given, your name's going to be taken out of the book of life. That's a rather serious warning, I would think. A rather serious warning. No marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Do you know how much the Bible talks about works? It doesn't say your works are going to save you or your works are going to lose you, but it tells you what's the result of your works. By their fruits you shall know them, the Lord Jesus Christ said. I say again, let no man think me a fool. If otherwise, let yet a fool receive me, that I boast myself a little. That which I speak, I speak not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly to this confidence of boasting. Seeing then that ye glory after the flesh, I will glory also. In other words, let me give you a little piece of taste of your own medicine here. For you suffer fools gladly, seeing you are wise. <laughs> he, he's talking tongue in cheek. For you suffer if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you in the face. I speak as concerning reproach as though we had been weak, albeit whereinsoever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Hey, let's, let's knock off the qualifications here. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, in labors more abundant. Now, look, this is what Paul is going through in the book of Acts. He is describing it to the Corinthians, but he's summarizing it for us. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths often. How many times have you been in jail? Well, let's say how many times have you been in jail for righteousness? Some may have been in jail for doing bad things. But how many times have you been in jail for doing right things. In deaths often, of the Jews five times received I forty stripes save one. See, the Jews were quite legalistic about that. The maximum they were permitted to beat a man was forty times. And so they always only beat you thirty-nine times just to make sure they didn't break the law and miscount and hit you forty-one times. Sort of misses the point. <laughs> of the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes, save one. That's 200 times he got hit with rods. Rather significant for the Apostle Paul to be saying that, because none of us have ever experienced it. Thrice I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. How many shipwrecks have you been in? How many times have you been stoned? A night and a day I've been in the deep. This was because he was a missionary. This was because he shared Christ in journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers. How many of you have gone down to Camden, say, at uh, 2 o'clock in the morning and walked the streets? What if you knew God wanted you to reach somebody down there in Camden at 2 o'clock in the morning? Or you got a call and you didn't have a car that worked, and you knew you had to get down there to help them, and you knew for sure that they were ready to trust Christ, would you go? Would you go? Or would you say, well, let's wait till 6 a.m., because I know most of the bad guys are off the street by 6 a.m. They sleep during the day. In perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen. It may happen here in America, folks, your own countrymen in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. Oh, I'm your friend, I'm your friend, Paul, let me help you out. And then they stabbed him in the back. In weariness and painfulness. How far did Paul walk during his life? I, I wish we could figure that out. The Apostle Paul had to walk every place he went that he didn't go by boat. Oh yeah, he did get a horseback ride when he was trying to escape the assassins at Jerusalem because the, the centurion there at Jerusalem put him on a horse with a bunch of mounted horsemen and soldiers so they'd get him to Caesarea so that he wouldn't get assassinated by those guys who had taken an oath that they would not eat anything until they had killed Paul. 
I hope they starved. Most of them probably broke their oath, found a way out of it. In perils in the sea, at perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often. And did you notice he put hunger and thirst in a separate category from fastings? Fastings is where you choose to do it. Hunger and thirst is where you don't choose to do it. In cold and nakedness. And he says, but you know, that's not what really bothers me. Hey, all that stuff is little stuff. That's the little stuff. That's the big stuff for most of us. But you know what was really on Paul's heart? He tells you in the next verse. Beside those things which are without, those are all externals. Those are all things that, hey, it's no big deal. What? Getting beaten with rods, getting beaten with whips, being shipwrecked, floating around in the ocean for a couple of days, risking robbers and murderers in the highway, risking assassins, going into places that you know are dangerous. Eh, no big deal, says Paul. What was his real concern? Beside those things which are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. You see, Paul had a heart for the church. The greatest agony of his heart was for the people he loved. He didn't care what happened to him, but he cared what happened to the people that he loved. Dear people, don't you understand that? Don't you understand what your pastor cares about? I care about you. I care about what happens to you. I don't care what happens to me. But I care very much about what happens to you. And whether or not someday I'll be able to give a good account for you. Read Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 7 and verse 17. Those two verses make it very clear that someday I will have to give an account about you. And I want to do it with joy and not with grief. That's what those two verses tell you. Beside those things which come on me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory in the things which concern my infirmities. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. <laughs> Here was another one of his exciting adventures in the, uh, on his missionary trips. In Damascus, the governor, under Aretas the king, kept the city of the Damascenes with a garrison, desirous to apprehend me. The government was after him. And through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. <laughs> you know, when God has a purpose for a man or a woman, he always opens the right doors, and if the door is closed, he opens a window, and he lets you down in a basket. When my time comes to go, there's nothing I can do to stop it. But until that time... And nobody can do anything to me. You have that confidence. You know, one of the popes made the con comment once that in doing battle with the Protestant troops, uh, he said, you know, the one thing that I fear the most is a Calvinist <laughs> doing battle against us because he knows that God is in control of his life. <laughs> we have a sovereign God, folks. We are accountable to him. We do not need to fear. We obey him, although we know that he is sovereign and his will will be done. 
It's hard to put those two things together, but that is the way the Scripture portrays it for us. That's how we see Paul. Paul had absolute care and concern for those to whom he was ministering. He wept for them. He prayed for them. He cried over them. He begged them. And Paul knew the sovereignty of God. Read Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11. He works all things according to the counsel of his own will. And yet Paul knew that he had a responsibility. I hope you can understand that balance. I hope that you can apply that balance in your own life. We have accountability, we have responsibility, and yet we can walk by faith because we trust the sovereignty of God who never changes and who guarantees the final results. That's what we see going on in these passages before us tonight. And then as we closed last week, we saw not only those stresses of 2 Corinthians chapter 11, but we saw the stress of the many farewells with people that Paul loved. He's here at Ephesus. He's going to go out and come back to Ephesus, and then he's going to give a final farewell to Ephesus as we get a little farther in chapter 20. And here in chapter 20, he knows it'll be the final farewell to that group of people as he weeps and as they say goodbye and as they come down to the beach to see him off. We see the stress of walking hundreds of miles. We see the stress of preaching. That's back in verse 2. We see the stress of short periods of time at each place. Verse 3, not having a chance to really stay a long time anywhere. We see the constant threat of death and assassination. What stress that would have been. How about if you knew that there was somebody waiting in the parking lot out here, sitting in a car with all the windows black, and you knew they were coming for you. I think you'd probably all want to walk out in a group and sort of try to make sure that everybody got into their own car safely. You see this car over there with its engine idling. You see the window crack down a little bit and a puff of cigarette smoke coming out the window. Maybe you hear some kind of raucous laugh out of the car. We're going to get you. Paul faced that every day. Folks, it could happen here in the United States. It's happened to Christians in other countries where there have been false friends who ultimately turned them in and they ended up in prison and some of them ended up dead. You say it can't happen in the United States. It could happen tomorrow. Are you aware of what's going on in our country. I don't say these things to frighten you, but I say these things because you need to make sure that you are ready spiritually. You need to make sure that you are prepared with the spiritual armor of God so that you can stand against the wiles of the devil. Paul was prepared. Paul had the care and provision for his traveling companions. He had to take care of some who would leave him, some who would get sick and Paul would not be able to heal them. Paul had the gift of healing, but some of them he had to leave sick. For 2 Timothy 4, 2, Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. Trophimus is one of his traveling companions here in our text. Trophimus is the guy who was with him when he went into the temple and they caught him and, and the Romans had to come down and rescue him. In chapter 21, the very next chapter, Trophimus, the guy who was a faithful companion of his. You know, some, some Christians are really helpful. Paul could count on them. Are you a person who can be counted on? Really counted on? Proverbs 25, 19, confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. Are you faithful? 1 Corinthians 4.1 Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. You are a steward. You have a master. You have been entrusted with the precious gospel of Jesus Christ. Are you faithful with the way you handle it? Can others always rely upon you because you are a Christian and you know you represent Jesus Christ to all those around you? 
Tychicus, one of the men in our passage, was that way. That you may know my affairs, this is Ephesians 6.21. Writing back to Ephesus, the place he's just been, how I do, Tychicus, a beloved brother and a faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things. Verse 24. Grace be with them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. To the Ephesians, written from Rome by Tychicus. That was his amanuensis, his scribe. Colossians 4, 7. All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. Colossians 4, 18. Salutation by the hand of me, Paul. Remember my bonds. Grace be with you. Amen. Written to, from Rome to Colossians by Tychicus and Onesimus. 2 Timothy 4.12, Antichicus have I sent to Ephesus, sending him back to his hometown. He was faithful to Paul. He stuck with Paul, whether he was in prison, out of prison, no matter where he was traveling. He took messages for Paul. He was with there to minister. Titus 3.12, when I shall send Artemis unto thee, or Tychicus, be diligent to come unto me to Nicopolis, for I have determined there to winter. Now that's the background for our text tonight, where we finally get verse 7. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. And there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep, and as Paul was long preaching. <laughs> oh, aren't you glad Paul isn't your pastor? <laughs> Listen to how Paul preached. Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Wow, that means I've got four hours and 15 minutes to go. And there were many lights in the upper chamber, where they were gathered together. And there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. And Paul went down and fell on him and embracing him said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. And when he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and eaten, hey, this is all after Tychicus fell out, and had talked a long while, even till the break of day, which means that service went on for another six hours. So he departed, and they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. Now, there, are, there are at least four major themes in that passage. I hope you picked up on a few of them as we went through. Number one, why we meet on the first day of the week. There are at least four reasons given in the New Testament. It tells us that on the first day of the week, when the disciples were gathered together to break bread, Paul preached unto them. So we see the church meeting on the first day of the week, even back in the early church. Why did they do it? There are four reasons. Number one, obviously, to celebrate the resurrection of Christ every week, not just at, quote, Easter. Some people don't know that. The reason we always meet every week on the first day of the week is to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. When you get up and come to church on Sunday mornings, do you think, praise the Lord, Christ rose from the dead on the first day of the week? What a joyful day this is. This is the reason I have hope. This is the reason that I know that because he died for my sins, that he actually died for my sins. If Christ is still dead in a tomb somewhere in Palestine, you have no hope. That's the point that Paul makes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If Christ is still dead, we are without hope. Our preaching is vain. But Paul says, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Ah, did you know that the resurrection of Christ is the basis not only for the resurrection of the righteous dead, but for the resurrection of the wicked dead, the judgment. Because Christ rose from the dead, not only do you and I have a glorious hope for the future, but because Christ rose from the dead, there is judgment coming for those who have not trusted him as their savior. That was the first reason that we meet on the first day of the week and why they were meeting. The second reason, this was the consistent practice of the early church to point to Christ, not the Mosaic law or pagan customs. What day of the week did the Jews meet on? 
They didn't meet on the first day of the week. They met on the seventh day. They met on the Sabbath day. The Sabbath is the seventh day. Every place you find it in Scripture, it is the seventh day of the week. Sunday is not the Christian Sabbath. Sunday is the celebration of the resurrection. The Sabbath day, the seventh day of the week, was what God gave to the Jews. He said in Exodus chapter 31, and we'll get there eventually if I ever finish the book of Exodus about 47 years from now. Uh, <laughs> we hope we get to the end of the book of Exodus. It's taken forever to get through the plagues. But uh, he said twice in chapter 31 that the Sabbath was a sign between God and Israel. It's a specific sign between God and Israel. Now, I'm not going to preach on the Sabbath tonight. But the church met on the first day of the week to show that they were pointing to Christ, not that they were pointing back to the Mosaic law. Christ fulfilled the law. And when we are in Christ, he has fulfilled it for us. It doesn't mean that we can live uh, some kind of a libertarian life. But our motivation is not the law. Our motivation is our love for Christ. And when you love someone, you do not do anything to them that would hurt them. Our motivation is Christ, not Moses. Our motivation and our empowerment is the Spirit of God, not the flesh. In the flesh, no man can keep the law. You are not under the law, but under grace. The whole book of Galatians is written to answer the questions of the legalists who had, had crept into the church and were trying to place, place the believers back under the law either for salvation you cannot be saved by the law. Or for sanctification. You are not sanctified by the law. You are sanctified by the grace of God and the Holy Spirit. And we've talked a great deal in the past about the different kinds of legalism that are out there. And most of the time, the world accuses you of being a legalist if you have standards. That's not legalism. Legalism is when you say you have to keep the law to be saved, either the law of God or the law of man. Or legalism is when some people say you have to keep the law of man to be sanctified. Others say you have to keep the law of God to be sanctified. No, that's, that's what legalism is. Look up every place that it shows up. Every place the law shows up in the New Testament, you'll come to that same conclusion. Getting off the topic. The consistent practice of the early church to point to Christ, not to point to the Mosaic Law. Number three, they met on the first day of the week to provide for a systematic and regular form of giving. First Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. In other words, don't just take up one big offering to try to impress me. Do it consistently. Do it every week. Make sure that your giving is unto the Lord week by week by week by week by week. So you don't have to panic at the last minute to take up a big offering. Paul's coming next week. Oh, my. What are we going to do? Well, let's scrape together the savings account. Let's scrape together some stuff out of here. And let's sell a, a few stocks and bonds to make sure that we, you know, are, are caught up. Number four. The first day of the week was the day of new beginnings. And this is very important. You see, the church was new and distinct from Israel. You've heard me preach on this quite a bit. The church is not Israel, and Israel is not the church. God gave some immutable covenants to the Jewish people who descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He gave covenants to them that he guarantees will be fulfilled, and I preached a whole series, and I hope you were paying attention, I preached a whole series on why Israel is not the church and the church is not Israel the clear distinctions, and the future promises that God still has for national Israel. Some tremendous, great, and precious promises in the Word of God that fulfill prophecy to the letter, not allegorically, not figuratively, not spiritualizing it, but God promising things to Israel as a nation. So, this is the day of new beginnings. And now we have a better set of promises, and that's what the book of Hebrews is all about. You've heard me talk about the better things of the book of Hebrews. The five warning passages against loss of heavenly rewards in the book of Hebrews. Very important book. First day of the week. Lesson number two. Biblical instruction, which was taking place here when Paul was preaching and the guy fell out of the window. Biblical instruction is more important than travel plans and other Sunday afternoon and evening plans. 
Note the beginning and the end of the passage. You see, the Apostle Paul was traveling through. He was going to have to leave. He was leaving the next day. So they wanted to make use of every minute of instruction that they had available. Every minute of it. Verse 7 says, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow. Now remember, this is the first day of the week. So he probably didn't start preaching at 8 p.m. Paul had been there for that day. He's still preaching in the evening. It's evening, probably after having preached all day. And after Paul raised Eutychus, look what it says at the end of the verses. Verse 11. When he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till break of day, so he departed. You know, it struck me as rather interesting that even a death and resurrection was not enough to stop that worship service, plus the Lord's Supper and an all-night Bible study. What about us? What about us? We're ready to skip church, especially the evening service, at the drop of a hat. And heaven forbid that we should come to a New Year's Eve watch night service so that we can all enter to the New Year with Christ instead of with the world. Let me be um, a little tongue-in-cheek here. After all, Pastor, don't you realize that most evangelical churches don't have an evening service? And the liberals stopped having an evening service a long time ago. Get with it. Evening service isn't cool. And forget about Wednesday evening prayer meeting. I mean, that's, that's a Neolithic alcoholic hangover that makes us all look like aboriginal loonies. Prayer? Ha! God helps those that help themselves. Uh, that's in the Bible somewhere, I think, or at least I heard it on TV. After all, Sunday afternoon is when there are important football games. And I use up all my energy cheering for my team, and the game might run into overtime. And remember, Sunday night, we go to bed between 10 and 11 because we have to get up early for work. And horror, sometimes pastor preaches until 8.30. I think somebody's math challenged on that one. And also remember... We have to get the kids off to school, and we need to be good, responsible parents and all that. Plus, we're tired after we've had a big Sunday dinner, and we're really not up to evening services anyway. Besides, our favorite TV show is on Sunday evening, and I'm sure God wants us to have some wholesome entertainment and family time. And very important, Sunday is the only day we get to spend with the family. And, of course, we're setting an example for them of what really is important for eternity, because we are so committed to Christ. And, hey... We can watch the services on the Internet when it's not broken, <laughs> like last week, with our bare feet on the table while we munch on snacks and soda. And so at the judgment seat of Christ, we have it all worked out. Hello, Jesus. Let me explain why your word and the fellowship of your people and the encouragement of the pastor and the body of Christ took second place. <laughs> I'm sorry. I hope you listen closely to those last few paragraphs. You might be able to pick up a few good excuses to use when you stand in front of Jesus not too long from now. And so what was lesson two again? We get it out of this passage. Biblical instruction is more important than travel plans. It's more important than other Sunday afternoon and evening plans. For people who love Jesus more than anything else in the world, it's one of the most important things there is. Lesson three. When the Bible is being preached, stop looking at your watch and stop thinking what you plan to do after church or what you'd rather be doing. You know, it used to bother me when people looked at their watches. It doesn't bother me anymore. What bothers me is when they pull out their calendars, <laughs> start looking at their calendars. Paul didn't stop at 8.30. He didn't stop at 9.30. He didn't stop at 10.30. He didn't stop at 11.30. He preached until after midnight to a packed house. They had no air conditioning. It was hot. It was stuffy. They weren't wearing T-shirts and halter tops and shorts to be cooler. Nobody complained. They sat tight and smelled everybody's sweat, and nobody had on Old Spice deodorant. There were no screens on the windows to keep the flies out, and no fly strips hanging from the ceiling to catch the flies. You know, it was sort of like being on the mission field today, where people often walk miles. For days they walk miles. They have even worse accommodations. 
so that they can hear the Word of God. How important is the Word of God to you? How thirsty and hungry for the Word of God are you? Jeremiah 15, 16. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. I am called by your name. When a man and a woman get married, except in our modern society, the woman takes the last name of her husband. We just had a wedding here a week ago out in the courtyard. Nikki Whitbeck is no longer Nikki Whitbeck. She's Nikki Myers. She's called by Corey's name. Have you trusted Christ? You are called by Jesus' name. He's your heavenly bridegroom. How much do you desire him? How much do you love him? You know how much love there is between a young couple. How much more lovely is our heavenly bridegroom? Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. Thy word! For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Listen to Job in the middle of his agony in Job chapter 23. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. You know what that means? That means if he had a choice between eating and having the word of God, even if he was starving, his necessary food, not his overage, his necessary food, he would shove the necessary food aside. If I have a, have a choice, if you were in prison, and if the prison guard came to you and said, today I'm going to give you a choice. I will either give you your food, and I know you haven't eaten very much for the last month. I will either give you a really nice bowl of food, or I'll give you one page of the Bible. One page of the Bible. And the guard gets to choose whatever it is. I mean, he can pull it out of Habakkuk if he wants, or he can pull it out of Malachi, or he can pull it out of someplace else. Lamentations. Which would you choose? I have esteemed thy word more than my necessary food. That's the way these people felt here the night they were listening to Paul preach. They were giving up food, they were giving up sleep, they were giving up comfort. They were giving up their personal time. They were giving up everything because they esteemed God's word more than their necessary food. You heard me read Amos chapter 8, verse 11. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord but of hearing the words of the Lord. You see, these folks that were listening to Paul that night didn't know if they'd ever get to hear it again. We just take it for granted. We assume that there will be a Christian radio station on tomorrow. We assume that there will be a church meeting on Wednesday evening next or next Sunday. We assume that nobody will come into our houses tonight and take our Bibles away from us. Dear folks, there's coming a day when there will be a famine for the Word of God. Are you getting all of it you can right now? Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. The woman at the well, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But that water should I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. That place was low on oxygen because all the oil lamps that were burning, it tells us that in the text. 
One kid decided to sit in a window for a little air. Serious mistake. <laughs> he started daydreaming. Then he started night dreaming. Then he started permanent dreaming. <laughs> Have you ever dreamed that you were falling? I dreamed that a couple of times when I was a kid. In other words, these people were serious about learning the truth about the true and living God. They were not playing church or attending because they always attended or because there was not something better to do and they weren't there to gossip or to hear the rock band perform Jesus freak music with strobe lights, electric guitars, banging drums, wailing half-naked worship leaders with wiggling bodies and waving hands. They were there to be instructed in the Word of God. This might be their last opportunity. They understood the urgency of the times and of the time. You know, there used to be a cartoon in uh, Christianity today called Eutychus and his kin. And it was always these guys dressed in, dressed in robes like in the first century. And it was always some kind of a little joke thing. And we may laugh at Eutychus because he fell asleep in church after a very long service. But at least he was there. I don't laugh at him. I've fallen asleep in church, even when I was up on the platform with somebody else preaching. <laughs> you remember on Mother's Day a couple of years ago, uh, I had just gotten back from a very, very, very long driving trip. And I'd had several breakdowns and had all kinds of horrible things happening. And um, it was, it was, it's a long story, and most of you know that story. Uh, how we finally got back and my brother-in-law had to transport some of them back here and I finally got back here myself in the morning like 15 minutes before the service began I was filthy dirty I was exhausted hadn't had sleep for like 48 hours and I'm sitting up here on the platform Jerry is preaching the Mother's Day sermon and I wished I had some two-by-fours to hold my eyes open I kept going like this you know I mean you know I don't I don't laugh at Eutychus he was there he was there There are at least 12 reasons to be there in body as well as in spirit. Number one, personal edification, spiritual growth, and Christian maturity. It's reason number one. God wants us to grow to be mature Christians. He wants us, not just wants us, he commands us to be there. Forsake not, your, uh, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. You see, it's the reception of the Word of God that brings about personal edification. It's the reception of the Word of God that brings about spiritual growth. Spiritual growth is what enables us to reach Christian maturity. The second reason to be there in body as well as in spirit is to set an example for other believers. Paul tells young Timothy, be thou an example of the believers. Be an example. You cannot be an example in spirit and not in body. Third, be an example for your children. Not a lot of us have children here. But we have a responsibility of being an example for them. Number four, you need to be there for fellowship with those who need to be encouraged and comforted. All around you, people have hurts, and most of us keep those hurts inside. We need encouragement. We need comfort. There needs to be somebody there who can help meet that need. That's what the body concept is all about. When one member suffers, the whole body suffers. When one member rejoices, the whole body rejoices. 1 Corinthians chapters 12 through 14, where he's talking about the exercise of the spiritual gifts. You cannot exercise your spiritual gift in a vacuum. Number five, and I hate even to mention this, but I will say it because it is important. Encouragement to the pastor who works like crazy trying to prepare wholesome spiritual meals only to have nobody show up. How many women hate it when their husband doesn't show up for a meal they've really worked hard on? And that's painful. That's painful. And you ladies know that. You see, when you show up, it tells him how important his work is esteemed by the flock. Number six. The reason to show up is preparation for future evil that God promises 
to all those who will live godly in Christ Jesus. If you're living a godly life, but you're not showing up, you're not prepared for what's going to happen. All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, Paul tells. Number seven, you need to be here so that you can prepare to teach others. So that you can prepare to teach others. God didn't just call you to sit and absorb. He called you to learn so that you can communicate and you can pass it on. You have contacts. Every one of us in here has certain contacts that nobody else in this room has. We have specific contacts to whom God expects us to pass it on. But if we don't have it, we can't pass it on. Number eight, you need to be here for preparation so that if something happens to the pastor, the elders, the deacons, and the teachers, you will be ready at a moment's notice to step into their shoes and fill them. In spiritual war, soldiers fall. And there has to be a second line that's prepared and ready to step into the place. I know you're familiar with the Revolutionary War and the way in which the British ran their formations. They marched in rows, and if the first man dropped, the guy in the second row that was behind him stepped into his place, and they raised their rifles and fired. They took a step forward, they loaded their rifles, they fired. Meanwhile, the enemy is firing at him. Another guy drops, the next guy in that line steps into his place and takes it. Did you know that concept is given to us in the New Testament? That's what Paul's talking about, not the Mormon concept, but when he talks about the baptism for the dead. Being willing to step up, publicly identify with Christ, step into the place of those who have just been killed. Are you ready? Preparation. So that if something happens to the pastor, the elders, the deacons, the teachers, you'll be ready at a moment's notice to step into their shoes and fill them. Number nine, you will never reach such astronomically high spiritual maturity that you don't need the teaching yourself. I constantly feel the need for teaching. That's why I read books. That's why I listen to messages by other men of God. I need it. Number 10, and this I think is very important. Why do we need to be here? Because you will have to give an account to Christ when you stand at the judgment seat, and that is not optional. You will have to give an account to Christ, and that is not optional. Number 11, another very important one that most of us never even think about. You are losing heavenly rewards by not being here. You are losing heavenly rewards by not being here. And number 12, very significant if you have any position of authority over anybody, you put yourself and those under you in risk of grave, deadly, spiritual attack when you don't take every opportunity to sharpen your sword and to learn how to use your spiritual armor. The very thing that you may be facing this coming week may be have, have been answered in the messages that you miss. Do you understand that God is in control of what this pastor preaches? Because God knows and plans your week in advance. God moves your pastor to preach something every week and I don't always know what it is. Sometimes God changes my message in the middle of the message and I have no idea why he did it. God moves your pastor to preach something every week that will be applicable to your specific spiritual need. When you skip out, you're not going to be prepared. God is sovereign. What I preach is not by accident. God made me your pastor for a specific reason and a specific purpose. Even though sometimes I think you may wish that you had somebody more personable or more charismatic or better able to draw big crowds, which obviously I can't do. But you know, God makes no mistakes. That was lesson three, 12 parts. 
Lesson number four. <laughs> Please don't fall asleep while I'm preaching because I don't have the apostolic gifts. If you fall asleep and crack your head on the back of the pew in front of you, I cannot heal you. Eutychus was not just knocked unconscious. The text says that he was dead. He fell from the third loft. Each story is about 10 feet high, so he fell about 30 feet. We don't know whether he fell backwards to the outside of the building or fell forwards into the crowd below, but he was dead. There sat, verse 9, in a window, a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep, and as Paul was long preaching, I better look out there, is anybody, <laughs> I've been preaching quite a while now, um, well, not too long, about average. Uh, as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. He wasn't just hurt. God is merciful even in the pain of our folly. He was merciful to Eutychus and to the whole church during that little incident. But let me remind you, God is not obligated to rescue us if we sin willfully. I don't think Eutychus was sinning willfully like he said, I think I'll go to church tonight and make a scene by falling asleep and falling out of the window. <laughs> I don't think that was Eutychus's purpose in going to church that evening. But God's not obligated to rescue us if we sin willfully and then stubbornly refuse to admit that we have sinned or make excuses why we're different and the rules don't apply to us. Now, I know I'm preaching to the choir because you all are here. But notice what God says about people who have good reasons for missing church. And the Hebrews had a very good reason, like suffering really severe persecution. That's what the book of Hebrews is all about. Encouraging not to forsake the assembling of themselves together because they were saying, man, every time we get together, they have a raid on us. They take away some of us. They kill some of us. They beat some of us. They've been taking away our houses. They're taking away our bank accounts. They didn't want to openly and publicly identify. And there are five warning passages in the book of Hebrews as to why they'd better not take that attitude. Let me just give you a little bit in relation to being in church. Hebrews 10, 24. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. They had an eager anticipation of what was coming. They knew that God had prophesied judgment on the city of Jerusalem. They're in Jerusalem. For if we sin willfully, that's in the context of skipping church. If we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and a fiery indignation, which shall devour. Think about a lion eating somebody up completely, licking its lips and leaving nothing but a few bones scattered here and there which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law, hey, think Old Testament for a minute, died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Now think New Testament of how much sorer punishment, worse punishment because we have greater responsibility, greater privilege, and greater empowerment. So therefore, when we violate what God wants us to do, the chastening is worse than death under Old Testament law. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite under the Spirit of grace? For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, now this is the part that scares me. We know that God is a God of judgment. We think about all those things that are going to happen to the earth during the Great Tribulation period. We think about all those things that God did to Pharaoh. And we think about all those things that God's going to do to all those bad guys. And all those people are going to be spending eternity in hell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God's a God of judgment. Last phrase of verse 30. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. That's written to people who decided it was okay to skip church. That's the context of verse 25. Verse 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. 
whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. If you never get spanked by the Heavenly Father, it's a proof that you're not one of His. So what happens if you fall asleep in church? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. It's powerful. It's a challenge to us tonight. All of us here, all of us, including this pastor, have sinned in not taking you as seriously as we should, in not loving you more, in not being 100% committed, totally sold out to Jesus Christ, giving excuses which pacify our pricking consciences, doing things that are only half-hearted, but failing to do what we know that you want us to do. We confess our sins, knowing that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Help us, Father, to walk in the light as our Lord Jesus Christ is in the light and to have fellowship with him and with you and with one another. Help us, Father, to look eagerly for his imminent return and to live like we believe it could happen at any moment, to live lives that are clearly, completely sold out to Jesus Christ. Father, perhaps there's someone here tonight who knows that what they've been living is only a half-hearted effort for Christ, taking advantage of the fact that we have all of our freedoms here in the United States, making excuses, failing to do what you have called us all to do, old and young alike. Father, I pray that at this moment you will reach that individual heart and cause them to commit to you that by your grace and in the power of your Holy Spirit and in obedience to the Word of God from this point onward they're committed to live only for Christ that they might do as Paul exhorts us to do in Romans chapter 12 1 and 2 I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Father, I pray that someone will have prayed that in his or her heart tonight and that you would honor that prayer, that you will take their sacrifice. A sacrifice is where we give ourselves to you until we bleed. We belong to you 100%. Body, soul, spirit, mind, emotions, will. It doesn't matter what happens to us. It only matters if we glorify Christ. We care not what the world says about us. We only look for the commendation of Jesus. We will stand before him. We will give an account. Will he be ashamed of us? Or will he say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. O oh, Father, I pray that it might be so. I pray that for me. I pray that for this people whom I love. These are your people. Someday I have to give an account for them to you. 
how well I've been a pastor, how well they responded to your word, and I won't be able to hide anything. Father, we commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen.